Welcome everybody. My name is Mark Medeiros. I'm the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at Peninsula Open Space Trust. And on behalf of POST, as well as our partners at Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District and the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, we'd like to welcome you to today's program on wildlife tracking featuring Pathways for Wildlife. Before we begin, it's important to acknowledge that the land in post working area and that of our partners has been home to many distinct communities of native people since time immemorial. We work to care and conserve these lands, the ancestral territory of the Amamutsun, Muwekma Ohlone, Ramaytush Ohlone, and Tamian Nation. These indigenous communities are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. And wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the native people whose land you are on. If you know their names, I encourage you to um, acknowledge them in chat right now. And we also welcome any uh, members of native or indigenous communities who may be joining us today. So first I'd like to tell you a little bit about Peninsula Open Space Trust. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with our work, uh, we wanna share this map. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit land trust founded in 1977. And since then, we've protected 80,000 acres of land in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Northern Santa Cruz counties. Of course, this work is thanks to the support of thousands of community members. Many of our donors are watching today. We want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, for your support. It's absolutely because of you that we've been able to be so successful in protecting land and oftentimes transferring these lands to public agency partners for long-term care and management. And so today we are partnering with two of those partners, uh, the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District and Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Created in 1972, Midpen is an independent special district that has preserved over 65,000 acres of public land and manages 26 open space preserves. Ranging from 55 to over 18,000 acres, these preserves are open to the public free of charge 365 days a year. Visitors will find 240 miles of trails ranging from easy to challenging terrain within these preserves. And just south of Midpen, there is the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, also known as OSA. OSA works to protect the quality of life in Santa Clara County by preserving open space and natural resources. Since 1993, the authority has protected over 25,000 acres of open space, natural areas, watersheds, and wildlife habitat, providing ecological friendly outdoor recreation for all residents of the area. So we're going to be learning about wildlife tracking, as well as a variety of wildlife connectivity and habitat restoration projects in our region. And before we um, describe pathways for wildlife, we want to show you this map um, to get your mind working here. So this map does not show counties or cities or roads. Instead, in yellow, you're seeing areas of high wildlife connectivity and high wildlife movement, including the Santa Cruz Mountains, both north and south of the Highway 17. You're seeing Coyote Valley cutting um, across the valley between San Jose and Morgan Hill into the Diablo Range, both, both north and south of the Pacheco Pass and San Luis Reservoir. So throughout this region, Wildlife are living their lives and moving as we go about our lives. And we often intersect when we're hanging out at public parks or on the urban fringe. And you might be wondering, you know, how do I understand more about wildlife in the region? How do I understand what I'm seeing out in nature, the signs and tracks? And, um, and just appreciate all this wildlife better. And to help us with that today, we have these two wonderful people, uh, Tanya and Ahiga from Pathways for Wildlife. And Pathways for Wildlife is this incredibly important organization at the center of a variety of groundbreaking wildlife research throughout our region. 
in partnership with many nonprofits and public agency partners, including Post, Midpen, and OSA, using camera traps, wildlife collaring technology, and other methods. Pathways for Wildlife is constructing a complex picture of how wildlife move across our landscape and what we need to do to enhance the health of these animal communities. Tanya and Ahiga are both incredible people. They are co-principals of Pathways for Wildlife. They're gonna share a little bit more about themselves in this program. So with that, um, I'm gonna welcome Tanya and Ahiga to the program. Hey Ahiga, hey Tanya. How are you both doing? Hi, hi. Doing well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Mark. Yes, thank you so much, Mark. You, you honor us, and we're so excited to be here today. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to to go tracking with everyone virtually. Great. Yeah. Well, I am so thankful. You know, on behalf of our whole community, we know you're so busy um, with so many projects in the Bay Area now, even further afield. Um, so we just appreciate you taking the time to share all this wonderful information with everybody. Um, I see a lot of folks are joining through chat. Hello, everybody. Um, and so I know you have a ton of information. I'm just going to peace out <laughs> and let you guys take over. Um, so with that, uh, you can we're going to add your slides to the, the program and you could just start in. I'll let you know when, when you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark. Hello, everybody. It is an honor to go over tracking with you and we have quite a bit to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about tracking basics and we're also going to talk about one of our favorite animals, the American badger. Since we have so much to cover, we're briefly going to talk about who we are and what we do. And then we're going to dive into some tracking basics. We're going to tell some awesome stories about one of our favorite animals, the American badger. And here we go. So nice to meet you, everybody. My name is Ahiga Sandoval. I'm a wildlife researcher and co-principal of Pathways for Wildlife. I'm Tanya Diamond, a wildlife ecologist and the other co-principal of Pathways for Wildlife. Thanks for having us here today. So about 11 years ago, Tanya and I created our own research organization, uh, Pathways for Wildlife. And we specialize in conducting wildlife connectivity studies. So what that means is we collect data on how wildlife move across the landscape, how they travel throughout valley floors, and especially how they interact with our highways and roads. To gather this data, we use a variety of methods, one of which with our awesome partners at Peninsula Open Space Trust and uh, OSA, we did a coloring study and we relied heavily on radio color data to find these guys, uh, the beautiful bobcat. We also rely on our tracking skills. So we collect tracking data. And one of our goals today is to have you be able to identify everything in each of these three pictures. Also, one of our favorites is camera data. Cameras are a, a very important tool for every researcher. They give us a very unique live, uh, look into the lives of animals and how they interact with our roadways. So if they cross safely or if they do not cross safely. So like I said, tracking is the, is the core skill that we rely on. It helps, us, it helps us read the landscape. And as a tracker, that's what you're gonna be able to do. You're just looking at the landscape like a book and you're just reading what animals left behind. So that brings us to what is tracking? Well, tracking is the ability to identify wildlife presence by the evidence that they leave behind. So whenever wildlife travel through an area, they're leaving something behind for you to find. So this could be hair, it could be scat, it could be prints, it could be a burrow, it could be bones, it could be anything, um, anything that, that you can find. And the way I like to think of it is like this. Whenever you come across a track, what you're doing is you're painting a mental picture in your mind of what that animal is doing based on a single track or a series of tracks. For example, look at this beautiful image in Coyote Valley. We're not just seeing these awesome raccoon tracks. What we're seeing is a raccoon headed toward one of our most dangerous highways in Coyote Valley, Highway 101. So we're visualizing that, and that's powerful. Okay, so our objectives for today is, uh, I had a neighbor the other day ask me, oh, so how do I become, how do I get into tracking? And I said, well, it's really just becoming more observant. 
like a lot of times we're just walking along and um, you know we're not really paying attention we're just taking in nature but what you want to do is you just want to tune your mind to listen to look and just notice any change in the environment and also we're going to learn the basics so we get tons of pictures of oh we got mountain lion track but it's actually a dog because canines and felines can be easily confused because we see their tracks so much out in the field and lastly after today we want you to be able to gather as much data as you can as you can possibly find when you're out in the field for example if you saw this log without seeing the bobcat would you be able to tell that it's, it's actually scratching it's using it as a scratching post and the answer is yes terrific and how many times have you walked along a trail and saw tracks like this in the trail and wondered what species are these so this is one of my favorite things after it rains is walking by and going wow a bobcat just walked by within the past 24 hours after it rained there's a gray fox track a gray fox walked along the same trail i'm walking on there's another track a deer track even coyote tracks so just within this one little muddy area multiple species have walked along this trail so at uh, the end of the day, as Ahiga mentioned, we want you to have those tools too. So we call it a tracking toolbox. When I first started tracking, I, I thought it was a mystery. It was something that needed to be innate knowledge, but it's just like anything, learning a language. It's the language of tracks. So, and uh, there's a lot of cool things to add to the toolbox. So today we want to go over the shapes of the pad, how many lobes are in the pad. That's a huge telltale feature. The number of toes and the shapes of toes. Is there claws or no claws? So that's where we'll start today. And by the end of the day, coming back, we should be able to look at these tracks and you'll know exactly these different species. So we'd like to start with uh, one of our favorite projects, American Badger and Burring Owl Habitat Assessment Study. And we're conducting this with the Mid-Peninsula Region of Open Space District and SFBBO. And this has just been an incredible study on so many different levels. So we began by creating a map we wanted to understand what does the landscape, what is the landscape um, features for badgers? What is highly suitable habitat for badgers? What is poor habitat? So we spent a long time creating a very in-depth model within GIS. And the color codes that go with this map is green is highly suitable habitat. Badgers are grassland specialists. They tend to only dwell in grasslands, but they'll move through chaparral. So that means like redwood areas, you're not gonna find badgers. They tend not to move through those types of habitats. They don't really move through dense cities. So yellow is fairly suitable habitat. Red is unsuitable. The black dots are the different badger records we've been collecting. And the yellow and orange swaths are different linkage designs. Because we learned from this model that the habitat is indeed fragmented for, lab, for badgers, we then decided we should run another analysis to identify important pathways that might be connecting the different mid-penned areas where we were finding badgers at. What were those important linkages between those different core preserves that were so important for badgers? We then began a two-year process of then ground truthing the model designs and all these different lines you see are one kilometer transects that we've been walking. A lot of area to cover. And to ground truth these linkages, we validated these models by actually going out and looking for badger burrows and badger sign. And we'll go over what, how do you identify a badger burrow? So tracking badgers, it's extensive, it's super fun, but it's also a lot of work. So we began ground truthing these models and we we're so fortunate to work with an amazing group of volunteers, MidPen volunteers. So they came out with us, we hiked these different hillsides. So here we're at Monte Bello, with our different volunteers, looking for different badger burrows, recording those, and then putting those in a database. We then set up cameras at the badger burrows, and that's where things got even more fun and interesting. What did we find? Check this out. So here is a badger at Long Ridge, and I find recording mountain lions is much easier than recording badgers. They move around a lot. They make new burrow dens almost on a nightly basis. So this was just a gem to find this. 
So now we have lots of different images and data of badgers using the different preserves and actually moving in between the preserves across roads. So we're really able to validate those models. And MidPen is going to use all this data so that they can help protect and conserve badger populations in the long term. So how to identify a badger bro? There's lots of different animals that make burrows. There's coyotes, there's foxes, there's badgers, there's ground squirrels. What does a badger burrow look like? So that's very interesting. They're oval shaped. And the width is nine to 10 inches across and the height is 10 to 12 inches, really large. I always say it's almost like you could fit a football through it. They're oval shaped because that's the way their body is. And they're fossorial diggers. They, they dig horizontally. So you have these oval shaped badger bros. And then you might see these burrows and there's huge throws of dirt in front of the badger burrow entrance, another telltale sign, because they can dig burrows down to eight feet deep. They're going really deep, especially it helps them when it's really hot and they're deep down into the earth where it's nice and cool. So if you see big throws of dirt, that could be a badger burrow. They're also one of the few species besides ground squirrels that make multiple burrows next to each other. And we call this a badger set. So if you're hiking, you see fairly big round holes in the ground, a bunch of them, you're probably looking at a badger burrow. And this is, uh, they use these as sleeping dens. And as I mentioned before, they'll dig a new burrow on a nightly basis. They're pretty amazing creatures. So then it can get a little more complex because then they dig for food. So you might see a bunch of smaller holes, kind of oval shaped, but they don't go very deep. So that's a badger, uh, digging and hunting. So we call those hunting digs. And that's not a sleeping burrow. So another really exciting part of the study is, are badgers providing burrows for other species and for important species such as burrowing owl? The burrowing owl population in Santa Clara uh, is doing actually quite poorly, unfortunately. So if badgers are providing habitat for burn owls, that's incredibly important. So we were thrilled to have recorded this video of a burn owl utilizing a badger burrow. So the owl was calling, you can see the scat was using that burrow for several months. So that was really exciting that the, the badger is providing habitat for burrowing owls. And then we were quite surprised when we recorded this little guy. Does anyone know who this is? Feel free to write in the, the comment bar. So this was exciting because Midpen, they'd heard that this species was here, they weren't quite sure, so we are very excited to document that's a long-tailed weasel using a badger burrow. Then it was really fun to find newts for using the badger burrows too. And then this was hilarious when even a mountain lion decided to stop by and check out the badger burrow. So that is badger burrows. What about badger tracks? Uh, I'm continually intrigued by badger tracks because uh, they're just amazing. They're powerful diggers. Look at those claws. They can dig out big, huge rocks. In fact, we've been at badger burrows and I was like, wow, I could hardly even dig this hole with a shovel myself. Very powerful claws and, and diggers. Really interesting um, pad shape. <clears throat> and one of the telltale images is they have five toes. So that's where I start. If I roll up on a track like this, Okay, my first thing, my tracking toolbox, how many toes does this animal have? Starting at the thumb, one, two, three, four, five toes. All right, so that means it's in the Mustelidae family. Do the claws register? They do, and not many species claws register like that. And then the front um, pad is rather long and it's fairly large, much bigger than something like a skunk. So already now I'm starting to dial down that this is a badger track. And then looking at another track, even if the track is not well defined like the previous track, I always start with the toes. It's really helpful. So, okay, I'm seeing five toes in there. 
look at those claws. Those are big, sharp claws. Animals like bobcats don't leave tracks like that. And again, looking at the pad shape. And then even when you're tracking in areas where the tracking substrate's not that good and it's much harder, find that one good track. And again, I was like, look at that shape of that pad. Very badgery shaped. It has five toes. The claws registered. So even if you're in challenging substrates, using the different tools, looking at the pad shape, the width, the height, and those toes, you can figure out what species it is. And uh, another thing that we have encountered with the badger study is the stripes. The stripes we think define the different species of badgers. And what's been very interesting in Santa Clara County, the badger stripe is going to the middle of the back. That's unheard of for any of the other subspecies. So we realized we should probably do a genetic study. So we're also collecting badger hair samples at the badger burrows. And Jesse Quinn at UC Davis is gonna do incredible analysis. So that will be really important to know what is the health of the badger population? Are they genetically isolated? And we are finding that the landscape itself, not just roads is fragmenting the landscape for badgers. So here we're up at Windy Hill Open Space Preserve and badgers are at the grassland, but looking out into the landscape, you can see that there's large ravines filled with huge densely thickets of redwoods and um, heavy forest. So that's actually fragmenting the, the landscape for the badger. Okay, so like Tanya said, whenever you approach a track, one of the first things you wanna do is identify how many toes it has. So just think how many other animals or which other species share that thing in common with badgers? What has five toes? So before we begin our little tracking journey here, uh, there's some things I want you to think about. So as we go through, when you see a video, you're gonna see a video first, then a picture, and then the track. Use everything that you have to see that video and try to say the animal's name out loud in, as fast as you can. This is training your mind so that when you see that animal in, in real life, when you see the animal, you're like, okay, I know what it is. I've identified the animal. Then pay attention to where it holds its weight. So a lot of animals hold their weight in the back, some animals hold it in the front. So when you see these animals, see where the weight's at. And then behavior, watch what the animal is doing and try to see if you could, if you could pinpoint its movements and if you would be able to identify that in the track. Okay, you ready? Let's do it. First animal, here we go. Okay, it's hanging from a branch that's not, <laughs> it's not on the ground, now it's on the ground. Look how it's moving around. Okay. Well, that's raccoon. And there's three of them. They're traveling through a culvert. And keep in mind, we have an infrared camera so we could see at night, but it's pretty dark out there. But see how they stand on their hind legs? Got one more for you. So now that now the branch is broken, so he found another one. The mouth is open. He's walking on his back feet. And you would think he'd be heavy enough to, to snap that branch, but he hangs on for a while. Okay, so that's raccoon. This is a raccoon track. And what I love about the tracks is, well, you could see those long, oblong shaped toes on the front and the hind. And I like to think of it as, look, they're just like us. Our foot, if we stepped in mud, would be long. Our hand would be very splayed. That's raccoon. Okay. Like I said, the toes are long and they're tapered. So they have kind of like a point at the at the end where the fingertip is. Next, the claws often register. So they don't have retractable claws, they're just always there. And they have very gentle hands. So you should see the claws in mud, which is their usual habitat. They're usually around uh, waterways. Those claws will be, will be pretty prominent. Okay. So why is the hind so large? That back foot, why is it so, why is it so um, large compared to the front? It's perfectly illustrated in this picture. Like you could see almost the whole sole of that foot, the whole pad. Whereas the front, it kind of starts to disappear at the lower left. Well, that's because the raccoon has a lot of weight in the back and it stands up. It, 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 the raccoon's hands are extremely gentle. So they're like, it's pitch black, their hands are in water, they're feeling around for food and they're just, they're, they have, these sensors on their hands that are so uh, sensitive, they can almost feel like they're seeing. They could, 
uh, feel crayfish, they can feel food, and all their weight at that point has shifted to the back. So that's why their hind is so large. Okay, what's this animal? This beautiful pair. Watch what it's doing. What is that skunk in the back doing? It's scenting. Okay. And that is our friend, Striped Skunk. Um, I love their tracks because they look pretty vicious. Um, they're really small, but they look vicious. If it was like a foot long, you would say, oh my gosh, this is a monster. All right, so let's go over it. So five toes, once again. So you're dealing with a five-toed animal. Okay. But then it's different. It's not just like a, a raccoon or a badger. It does have vicious looking claws in the front. And why? Well, because they're closely related to badgers. They like to dig too. So skunks do dig and they have very powerful claws for that. Next, the front and hind are asymmetrical. And this is true for the raccoon too. So asymmetrical means it's just like us. If you were to fold your hand in half and bring it together, the two sides would not match up. They are different. There is a left and there is a right. So right there, you know, okay, if I come across this track, it has claws, it has five toes and it's asymmetrical. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way, I could, I could identify it. And then you're like, okay, well, here's, here's, where we get, here's where it gets, where we know what it is. It has a three layered foot. This is true for the front and the back. So it has toes, it has a midsole and it has like a heel. It's like wearing a boot. So if you come across that, you instantly know that's striped skunk. Okay, so question, the picture to the right, which is the front and which is the hind? Just based on the knowledge that we learned from the picture on the left, just use that toolkit to figure out which one is which. Okay, that's the front because those long big claws and that's the hind because it has those three layered, the three layered foot, it's like wearing a boot. Now, extra points for all of you trackers who caught the mouse tracks right here. It's okay if you miss them. We were just focused on the uh, skunk track, but they are there and they are visible. Okay, what is this awesome animal? Pay attention to what it's doing, how it's walking. Is it going fast? This is uh, from uh, one of our favorite properties, the Pacheco Creek Reserve, owned by the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. That's kind of that's quite a bit of a drop, but that beautiful animal was able to hike up it with no problem. Well, that is the Virginia opossum. I found this guy in Kaidi Valley. He was playing dead. I scared him uh, just near the Kaidi Creek Trail. And let's go over its tracks. I absolutely love opossum tracks. They're so cool looking. Um, and you know, when you see these tracks, you could almost like guarantee, like there's really nothing that looks like them, but they do have five toes, just like we've been discussing on the front and the back and they're splayed. So it means like if you were to hold your hand out and just spread it as far as possible, that's how opossum tracks are. Uh, we call this like a star shape. It looks like a starburst. There's fingers in all directions. Okay, next. Why is the thumb so big on the hind foot of the opossum? Well, that's because there are only marsupial here in North America and they climb a lot. They have actually a really strong grip. And um, when they play dead, they'll just grip onto a stick and just stay there. And it's really strong. It's extremely muscular. And just to give you some context, because measurement is everything, we have a saying in science, if, it, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. So uh, it's, it's really, between one to two inches long, and it's really wide. It's 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 like two and a half inches wide because again, that's that splayed, that splayed um, figure that they have. So if you come across that, you instantly know this is our awesome opossum. Okay, what is this animal? Or correction, these animals. Imagine uh, getting to see that in the wild. Okay, I've got one more video for you. And here's actually a warning. Um, if you're wearing headphones, you might want to turn your volume down just a little bit because uh, it could be loud. So sound warning here. And I want you to think about what is the sound this animal is making called?
pretty awesome. Well, that is our friend Puma. So Mount Lion and also it's Caterwall. So that the name of that sound is called Caterwalling. And that was a female actually calling to a male. Um, beautiful animal. This is a picture I actually came across this uh, this individual last week, live sighting. And I was pretty stoked because every time you come across these animals, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. <laughs> okay. So let's go over the track because this is the big track that everyone sends pictures about. They're like, oh, is it a mountain lion? So right now, <laughs> just look at it. Look at this picture in its purity uh, before I completely dissect it. Um, this is a good substrate. Just take this track in. Okay, now we're going to go over it. All right. So first of all, there's no claws. This is in extremely soft soil. This is at the Pacheco Creek Reserve, owned by the Habitat Agency. The soil is ex like if you dropped a penny, you could probably see the detail. This is perfectly substrate tracking. No claws, absolutely none. Almost any other animal would leave claws. Okay. Next, it has those four tear-shaped toes. Okay, very forward placed. Well. We, we know that now, so now now what? Well, now we look into the metacarpal. So it's like the palm of your hand, it's the pad, and it has two lobes at the top, right here, okay? Once you see that, you're like, okay, I, 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 could, I could pretty much identify this animal, but the, the, the giveaway is the three lobes at the back. And lobes are like these little protrusions in the pad for gripping. And right there, once you see that, you know, okay, I'm. I'm I'm dealing with a cat, this is a mountain lion. But also, it forms, those lobes form a trapezoidal, a hexagonal shape. That pad, it's like, it's we call it like a mountain, so it could almost spell M if you were to connect those uh, circles on the screen. It will spell the letter M for mountain lion. Next, if you come across this, you automatically know this is a puma. It's asymmetrical. It has a left side and it has a right side. Okay. Oh, and this is a rather large track. It's three and a half inches long. Pretty, pretty, pretty long for uh, our cats here in California. Okay. So here's an actual puma puma paw. So kind of a trick question here. How many toes does a puma have? Well, the answer is it has five toes, but the thumb, the toe number one, has regressed up to the forelimb just a little bit. It's a very massive claw. It's very powerful. So let's go through it. Toe one is like the thumb. Toe two is like the in, your index finger. Toe three is like your middle finger. Toe four is like your ring finger. And toe five is the pinky. And again, the two metacarpal lobes, at the, the two lobes at the top of the metacarpal, the palm, the pad, and three at the rear. Perfect. And I just love this picture. This is uh, was taken by one of our awesome uh, awesome tracker, one of our friends, David Moskowitz. This is what trackers live for: seeing deer track or seeing puma track next to deer track. That is, it's just a beautiful picture. Okay, so let's go into canine versus feline because this is the big one. This is the, um, you know, this is where we get all of our pictures from. People are like, oh, you know, what is it? People will post and be like, oh, it's a mountain lion track, but it's actually a dog. Okay, so first, the feline. Remember, it's asymmetrical. There's no claws. This is in snow, and there's no you can't see a trace of claws. Um, it has three lobes at the bottom, two lobes at the top, giving that trapezoidal shape pad, and it's asymmetrical. So right there, that's the feline. This is true for bobcats. It's used for house cats. It's true for any cat. The canine. The canine is even even a dog. They have their, their claws will show. This is a coyote track. The, you could see the claws at the top, uh, at the top two toes, one lobe at the top of the metacarpal, the, the pad, and two at the bottom. It gives it what we call an arrow-shaped pad. So it looks like an arrow. And do you see how the puma track, or the feline track to the left, it actually looks very round, whereas the canine track, it's very, like, it's long. And that's how you can tell the difference. Okay, let's move to our next animal. One of my favorite videos. Again, pay attention to weight, pay attention to movement. I don't think there was a single animal walking in that video. <laughs> that is our friend Coyote. 
beautiful animal. I love coyotes. They're, we see them at almost every study site we're at. And um, the only thing you can confuse coyote for is like a dog. They have amazing tracks. It, it's like, I like to see their tracks. It's like evolution at work because one, it's extremely compact. They are built for endurance. They're built for traveling a long distance. It shows in the way they walk and it shows in their track. If you were to see a coyote track, the we, we have this uh, this thing that we do where you could draw an X across the toes and, and at the forefront of the pad because it's so tightly together and those toes are perfectly placed. It's just for endurance, for traveling long distances across the landscape. Next, minimal to no presence of claws. So in the middle picture, that's in mud. This is in Coyote Valley. And in mud, even that track is kind of splayed a bit. You can see, like, uh, compared to the right, you can see how the, the track is, like, the toes are kind of separated. And even still, there's no uh, no presence of claws. Next, there's one lobe at the top, two lobes at the bottom, giving that perfect arrowhead shape. And you know you're dealing with a coyote. There's that triangular shape. Also, the toes face forward. So the picture to the left, you could actually follow that coyote all the way down. We, I think I tried, this was at IBM. Uh, OSA got us permission there. It was awesome to be there. It was in the mud, but the, every single track is exactly in the direction that coyote wants to go. Okay. And the track is smaller than a puma. So if you come across a coyote track, you, you shouldn't confuse it for a puma. It, it's, it's very compact. It's the length is two to three inches and the width is like one to two inches. So it's longer than it is wider. And it's a very beautiful track. Okay. So let's do Kaidi versus dog. Tanya, do you want to take this one away? This is actually her photo. I love this picture. This is one of my favorites. Yes. Cause so easily confused. So thank you. He did a beautiful job going over those tracks. And yes. So if you've figured out how to identify a Kaidi track, how do you, how do you distinguish that between a domestic dog track? And there's some really great characteristics that help us. Caddy tracks are compact, thin, and they have very minimal claw marks. They almost look like little pinpricks just in the, in the sand or the dirt. And that's usually only um, on the two top middle toes. And you often don't even see the claws registering in the, the toes that fall beneath those two top toes versus domestic dogs you'll see very blunt uh, claw marks. Um, and that will be also registered among almost all the toes. And the track itself is very splayed. It's not compact like a coyote. Coyote, nice, tight, almost rectangular shape versus dogs, very large trapezoidal shape. And the toes uh, point outwards, uh, not forwards like the coyote. So uh, the pads are also usually very big and splayed out versus the pads of the coyote and especially the hind, which we will go into for our advanced tracking workshop where we go over fronts and hinds, also left and rights um, of tracks. But the hind of the coyote is particularly very small, much smaller than the front pad of the, uh, the track in the coyote. So you can see here the coyote track, it's almost just like a little dot, like a penny shaped pad. That's the hind of a coyote versus the hind track of a domestic dog will always register almost as large as the front of the track. So whenever we roll up and we're like, oh, could that be a little collie dog or even someone's very small little chihuahua dog? Uh, we look at those pads and the, the pads of the domestic dog always register really big and you'll often see blunt claw marks versus the faint little pinpricks of a coyote. So that's one of my favorites because so easily confused with, with uh, the other canines. So, important part of our work is to identify linkages for species like badgers and mountain lions, um, linkages that they're traveling through. And currently our mountain lions are under review as a candidate species for listing due to the low genetic diversity. So our mountain lion population is actually not doing well in, in dire straits. So the map over to the right you see is a different GIS linkage model design that we're using to ground truth. We're using as a blueprint. And we have different studies in which we're looking at what are these important linkages to facilitate movement for all species out of the Santa Cruz Mountains down in the Dibler Range. 
And our current projects include the Badger and High Week 17 study, our work over in Cali Valley, which we'll be talking about in the next workshop, and down at the State Route 152 Pacheco Pass. And these studies, we're working on facilitating wildlife movement between these mountain ranges. So now we're going to leave the, the peninsula and we're going to move over to 152 down over into the Pacheco Pass. And we're going to do some virtual tracking together down there. So we're thrilled about this project. We're working with the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. And this is at the Pacheco Creek uh, Reserve is the map you're looking at. We're conducting a State Route 152 Pacheco Creek Wildlife Study. And all of those different dots are dots where we put up our camera stations. So it's an extensive ray on a very large landscape. And so every time we went up to set a camera, we used tracking to, to try and understand how are animals moving through the Pacheco Creek Reserve in relation to the highway? How are they moving across 152? So we set up cameras throughout the reserve. We set them at various culverts and bridges. And we're thrilled when we first set up the camera the first week recorded this video of these two bobcats at one of the culverts at the Pacheco Creek Reserve. What are these two cats doing together? Typically, they like to hang out by themselves. So we think that this is a bobcat on a date. So we are hoping to see kittens at the preserve this summer. So let's get into bobcat tracks. So he did such a fabulous job going over mountain lion tracks and keep all that information in mind because it applies to felines as well as bobcats. I'm sorry, for all felines, <laughs> such as bobcats. So their tracks, much like the front track of a badger, is about one to two inches long and then one to two inches in width. And so I found this track in the middle of Caddy Valley, 2008. And when I rolled up on it, you know, a lot of folks didn't think bobcats are actually traveling through the agricultural fields in Caddy Valley. So I was pretty excited, but it was also very important to be able to document this well, that this indeed was a bobcat track and not a house track, but a house cat track. So here's a picture of that, 2008, time sure does fly. So let's go over what makes up a bobcat track. They are terrific commuters. They love to travel through creeks, along creeks. They use bridges and culverts all the time. And much like the mountain lion, they have three lobes on the bottom of the pad, just like the mountain lion. That's typical feline characteristic of all feline tracks. So before I even look if there's claws or no claws, I always look at the pad. It's really the telltale. And then there's those two lobes at the top of the pad, just like the mountain lion track that he went over. And I didn't see any claws. This is also a really helpful uh, way that a lot of trackers study tracks. Um, you see these types of images in a lot of the tracking books. So what someone had gone out and done, this was Mark L. Brock's work, and they used a track plate with bobcats. So they created a suited track and had a bobcat by a bobcat walk across it. And again, really helpful to understand or distinguish those three lobes on the bottom of the pad. They'll often show up even in substrates that are really hard to see the whole track. Look for those three lobes. Then you look through those two lobes at the top of the pad. Are there claws registering? No claws. And we'll look at this image again because it, it, the story gets even more complex because we can actually tell if this is a female or a male bobcat and which track is left and which ones are uh, rights, which is the front, which is the hinds. So we'll go over this again in more detail for the part two tracking workshop that we hope you will also attend. And again, claws typically do not register. And they have very trapezoid shaped pads. That's another thing to, to look at when you're out in the field and it's a mucky track or you know you're in tracking along the beach and it's very sandy it's hard to tell look for the shape of the pad itself if you can't see the lobes you can actually use the shape of the pad so if we can't really see the lobes and we're wondering if it's a coyote versus a bobcat we'll look at the shape that trapezoid shape will always be pretty distinguished versus the more rectangle shape of a coyote scat We'll do more scat in the part two workshop. Uh, but bobcat scat's really easy to distinguish because it's very boxy, very segmented. So that is a telltale sign of a bobcat scat versus very ropey and twisty scat of coyote. 
and then domestic cats. So this gets really interesting too, because then when we're in Coyote Valley, we knew there was bobcat kittens. So we'd see you know, these feline tracks and we're like, well, could it be a kitten or is it a domestic cat? What's really interesting with the domestic cat is those pads, they will never be more than an inch. Um, kitten tracks, however, will always be two inches or more. And sorry, I should have included uh, uh, the width. So the width of the pad would never be more than an inch for a domestic cat. By the time any bobcat kittens are out there traveling with their mother, they're, they tend to stay with the natal den when they're very, very small. So by the time you would see any kitten tracks out along riparian areas and while you're going for hikes along the trails, those, those, those pads are gonna be about two inches um, long um, versus the, the domestic cat. Oh, can we go back? Yes. Oh, it's it's uh, probably best to point out that the the track next to my hand is actually oh. a coyote track, but the house, the domestic cat track is on the top of the picture. Oh, we didn't have an arrow for that. No. no. But that's a perfect <laughs> example of coyote versus uh, domestic cat, by the way. Look at the size difference. We usually never go by size, just by eye out in the field, but you can see that that massive difference. Thank you. All right, folks, who's this? Who made that sound? All right, so that's a gray fox and a jay calling out. That could have been an alert signal that there was a predator rolling around. So let's go over gray fox. Gray fox, even for some advanced trackers, gray fox can be tricky. But again, there's some terrific telltale signs. So I love this picture um, of this track. Uh, Hika, do you want to go over this one? Oh, excuse me. No, go ahead. You're, you're right. doing very well. <laughs> so they're like miniature caddy tracks in a way where you can have that one high lobe. The nails will often register just at those front two top toes. Not, they don't register as much um, in the lower toes, but the pad's a bit different, much smaller as you can see in length and width than a coyote. But they're, the pad, it forms almost like a wing shape. It's very, very wide. Those two lobes aren't very pronounced in the bottom, but it's definitely very rectangular shaped. So wing shaped, wide, one lobe on top, and just one inch in height. Very, very small. So um, even the smallest dogs, like a chihuahua, you're still going to see those blunt claws versus just the pinpricks. So a lot of it's also in the nails when it comes down to these canines. What do those claws look like? How are they registering? Are they big blunt? Are you only seeing claws at that, the two top toes? Um, and so they'll re register. And this is a, a good example because it's perfect substrate, you know, nice sandy. So you're going to get everything that would typically register would re register in a substrate like this. So this is out with some students when I was teaching. Um, some time ago, and we created some fun track plates, and we baited them with cat food. Gray fox love cat food. <laughs> they were suckers for it, and they left us some terrific tracks. And so here you see that wing-shaped, very wide track, very small though, just one inch of the gray fox. The nails hardly even registered here. So if this was a domestic dog, the, the, the claws would certainly register and be very big and blunt. All right, moving over to the Pacheco Creek Reserve Bridge. In past that bridge, we get lots of big mammal movements. I think folks are pretty familiar that this is deer and we have mule deer here. So our deer are mule deer. And any bridge that deer are traveling under is incredibly important to identify and record. And so when we get up to these different areas, where do we set up a camera if we wanna make sure to record deer? So deer tracks are great, and I'm sure folks are pretty familiar with deer tracks, but um, they're very different in terms of the front and the hind. So the front is very splayed, it's splayed apart, versus the hind makes that, folks will say that heart shape, you can almost draw a heart around it. That's the hind hoof of a deer. So you have the front, which is splayed, and the hinds make that heart shape. 
question also that deer, uh, when do they grow their antlers? When are their antlers in velvet? Do folks know? In the spring. Then when do they shed those antlers? After they grow and then they rub the, the velvet off on the trees. If you're looking for antlers on the ground, you'd be looking between December and March. What about rut season? So here's these two practicing their rut. It's in fall. So that's when males group together and they uh, are competing for females. Our next ungulate, the wild pig. So this pig knocked over our camera. Now it's all crooked and there's its little culprits running away. <laughs> so a lot of folks like to know the difference between deer and pig tracks. So let's get into pig because that's uh, very different than a deer track. So you can see it's boxy, it's square. Very blunt hooves versus the sharp hoof of a deer. Very box-like track. And let's do a side-by-side -side comparison because there's a really interesting telltale. And often if you can't really quite see the difference in the hooves, there's some, there's another really cool tool for your toolbox that you can use to distinguish between the difference between a deer and a pig. So first you look for those pointy claws of a deer, the rectangular shape that the overall track makes versus the boxy shape of a pig. Here's what gets really, really interesting. The dew claws fall directly below the hooves. So you can literally draw a line along the hooves and the dew claws will fall right underneath those hooves. Versus the pig, the dew claws cup the hooves. If you were to draw a line along the hooves, the dew claws would fall outside of the hooves. So if the hoof shape isn't giving you enough information to figure out if it's a deer versus a pig, look for those dew claws. And that is a really interesting telltale sign. Let's look at some real life pictures. Here we have those dew claws falling right behind the hooves there. However, on the pig, they're pointed outwards, almost cupping the bottom of the hoof. So there you have it, deer versus pig, which is very interesting when you're, you're out in the field. Scat's very, very different. So on the left, we have deer scat, which are pellets versus barrel pig big round, it's almost like quarters being piled on top of each other. It reminds me of a pig's tail. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Just, just think of like a, a pig's little <laughs> curly tail. Great, great. All right. Who's this Pop, giant? Pop quiz, who is this? Who's this beautiful <laughs> animal? Look at the cars in the back. So that's a tule elk. And yes, we do have tule elk in Santa Clara County. They were brought in and we were absolutely thrilled when we recorded tule elk at the, at the preserve property and traveling close to 152. They're very sensitive to disturbance. That's why you don't often see them. They tend to keep to themselves. So when we found that they were traveling through the property, we knew this was super important, um, making the Pacheco, the Pacheco Pass linkage area even that more valuable. And they started traveling all throughout the property along with mountain lions. So it's a very special preserve. And before we recorded the elk actually on video, we saw tracks within the Pacheco Creek. And we were so excited because we were like, my goodness, that is an elk track. So here we have the front track, very long, three to four inches long, and then very wide, five, I'm uh, sorry, four inches wide, much different than the deer track. So nice side by side. Uh, they both uh, splay in the front. They both have pointy tops, but much, much bigger track. Here, we also found the scat. So here's my boot and we were pretty thrilled and we we're emailing and texting everyone at the Habitat Agency and see, oh my goodness, here's some elk scat right in the creek. A lot like deer scat, but much bigger, almost the size of penny. So let's do it side by side. We have elk to the left, deer in the middle, and then, well, what about cow? So we know that uh, the pig has boxy tracks, but the cow are just huge, very box-like, very different than 
our elk and our deer. All right, let's review, shall we? Pop quiz, what species is this and why? All right, for folks who are saying bobcat, you're correct. Typical feline track, no claws, two high lobes on the top of the pad, three lobes on the bottom, and it has that trapezoidal shape. How about this species? What species is this and why? If you're thinking coyote, you're right. Look, the claw is registered, but even in this deep snow, just very faintly, two top, um, the two top uh, toes, faint registration. If this was a domestic dog, boy, you'd see big blunt claw marks all over the place. One high lobe at the top of the pad, two lobes on the bottom, and there you have that triangular shape that a Higgin went over. All right, what species is this and why? Well, I'm going to use those dew claws falling right behind those hooves, and I'm going to say deer. What do you think, Higa? That's a deer. A, a nice, nice set of tracks. All right, everyone. My favorite track. That's your hint. Go through your toolkit. <laughs> so, five toes. Yes. And I should have gone a little more into it. The, this front track of a badger um, is two to three inches long and it's one to two inches wide. So when you're looking at the pad of a track, and again, it's very different, right? Than the bobcats with those two high lobes. Um, it's very different than the, the coyote with the rectangle shape. Um, their pads are very different from other species. So that's another telltale tie. I don't even know how to describe that shape, but the, cool. it's, <laughs> it's beyond asymmetrical. Like, yes. They are so powerful. This is like, uh, it's almost like contorted. Like if you see, it's so surprising how badgers like evolve. Like they have, they're built for digging, but they actually run pretty fast. Like if you watch that badger kind of video, the badger's like hightailing. It's like, it's going pretty quick. And it's so unique. Look at that track. It's super asymmetrical. But thank you, perfect. And again, look how those claws register. The claws do not register like that with the coyote or the bobcats, even a domestic dog. Okay, what do folks think about this? We're getting towards the end. Here's our bobcat. Why is it not a mountain lion? If you don't have a ruler handy and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, what's the difference? You can look around. And so if you're here, I use scales. So that next to the bobcat tracks are ground squirrel tracks. And so Mount Lion would be much larger than that. So you can always use the uh, different species tracks as reference for scale if you don't happen to have a ruler out there. This is tree squirrel. Tree squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and what species made this and why? Here's our badger bro. Oval shaped, width 9 to 10 inches, height 10 to 12 inches. So there you have it. Last one, what species is this and why? You come across this, you come across this track out in the field and you're like, oh my gosh, look at this track, it's big. What is that? Exactly, if you see a big Great Dane track, I get excited, I roll up on them, oh my gosh, could it be a mountain lion? Oh, sigh, nope, there are those blunt claw marks at the top, not a mountain lion, and then there's that shape, that rectangle shape of a canine. So that's gonna lead me with my toolbox to drill down that it's not a lion track, it's a domestic dog. Blunt claws, one high lobe, bummer, not a mount line, but keep tracking. Uh, lastly, um, one of our favorite things to do is to make casts of tracks. Super fun. You can go to Michael's or go online and order a plaster cast. We found these beautiful mountain lion tracks during the badger study. So our first thing was drop everything and make casts. And this is what they turn out to be look like. So it can be a really fun way to document. And um, it's one of our favorite Christmas gifts is to give casts to our, our friends and colleagues. Absolutely nothing says that you know how to track better giving someone a cast of a track that you found. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, and stay tuned. So next time we're going to over front versus hinds, right, left. We'll get a little bit into gate. We'll review again some of these. and. Uh, I see folks asking for where else can we learn? There is the ultimate tracker certification training. This is my mentor, Casey McFarland, who is head of the Cyber Tracker Group. 
This is their uh, website. And they host tracking training seminars and they're two days long, intensive, exciting tracking going from the basics to advance and you too can become a certified tracker. So we'll go uh, more into that for our next workshop, but I highly encourage everyone to look at the website and what we'll be doing this coming year is having Casey come out and we'll reach out and let folks know. So folks who would like to join the workshop, it is one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. Um, as a wildlife biologist and to learn tracking. And you can show up with zero skill. And by the end of the day, you will learn so much. It's an incredible experience. You will be able to read the landscape like a book. Yes, yes. And if you'd like to learn more about our Badger and Burring Owl Habitat Study, uh, MidPens put together a great resource and it has more videos and updates and a great, um, uh, it was a great project um, done by Crean. Um, our project manager and she went over and did this wonderful video about our study. So please check it out. And the next time that you're out tracking and you look down on the ground and you see a bunch of cool tracks like this, we hope that you will now have a toolbox to try and identify and understand who made these tracks. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. We hope we gave you some extra tools for your toolkit. That was spectacular. Thank you both. Oh my gosh. Thank Man. you, Mark. Thank you so yeah. much. I mean, I thought I had put in some work to learn this stuff, but there's like five, six main takeaways that I have that it's just, it's a lifelong journey, right? Even it for is. both of you. <clears throat> yeah, we're yeah. constantly learning, constantly learning when we go out. Even to this day, sometimes I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, like I, I gotta get a better look at that track. But you get a guy like Casey or like the master Kim Cabrera, you get these trackers who've been doing it for, they just specialize at that one thing and they do it all the time. They could just walk through and be like, okay, there's a bobcat, there's a puma, there's a coyote. And that's the goal you want to reach. That's that's amazing. And, you know, um, everybody, you, you just heard it from two of, like I said, they're probably not going to say it themselves, but two of the most important researchers in our whole region here. Oh, right. uh, so, so it's, you know, it's been a real privilege to hear from you. And another thing I want to remind everybody is just that over the past 10 years, even before that, but just thinking about the time I have been engaging in this type of work is that we've just been getting a more and more clear picture, um, new discoveries all the time of just what species are on our landscape, where they are, how they're moving. And it's so, in, thanks to a huge part to your work that we're discovering these things and getting a better um, view of what's going on and what we need to do um, to support these these animals in the future. And tons of thank yous coming through. Um, thank you. Yeah, so, so I think we're at time. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for sharing that resource um, about the certification nice. course, um, and we'll look for other resources to share. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just say, you know, check out pathwaysforwildlife.com and learn more about their work. Follow them on social media too. Um, you know, make sure to track what's going on. And then we're gonna be having you folks back on July 9th, Friday, July 9th for part two. Like you said, there's a lot more learning to do. Um, so if you haven't registered and you'd like to register so that you um, are notified, you don't forget, you could join us at openspacetrust.org slash events. Um, in between now and July 9th, we're, we're having another wonderful expert coming on, Dr. Emily Taylor. She's going to be talking about rattlesnakes, oh, wow. and, um, rattlesnake ecology, and um, how to stay safe with rattlesnakes. So um, you could join us for that too. So with that, I'm going to let you all go. Hopefully, you know you have a nice weekend, and before you get back out there tracking and setting camera tracks, um, thank you again so much to both of you. Thank Mark, you, thank you. you. We're, this was so much fun. We, and uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning. Uh, yeah, on our social media, stay tuned. We're going to start a tracking tips Tuesday. So every Tuesday, we will take some uh, pictures out in the field and go over what that track is, so we can continue this conversation with everyone and let us know if you have questions from the workshop. We'd love to answer them. 
That's awesome. I'm definitely going to follow that. All right. See you all next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.